Welcome to the Creative and Account Podcast. This podcast was created to educate people about the world of advertising and branded content from the unique lens of two professionals working on opposite sides of the spectrum. I'm Frank DeLaRoyo, CEO and Creative Director at Straight Shot Post, a full-service post-production company that focuses on branded content. My co-host, Melissa Reisman, is an account director at BBDO, one of the largest and most well-respected agencies in the world. We hope to help you navigate through the challenges you'll face daily as you develop your career or business in this dynamic and quickly evolving field. Hi, everyone. It's Melissa and Dale. <laughs> <laughs> and this is FDA. the Creative and Accounts Podcast. So on today's show, we're going to be talking about how Dale got his start, since I know we went through how I got my start. And we'll talk about lessons he learned and how he got to where he is today and if there were some bumps along the way obviously in anyone's progression to get where they are right now so yeah we have a lot to talk about but first I'm sure if you could see what's going on with me I look a bit different than some previous podcasts I guess I'll let it out right now so I did get hurt while I was on my honeymoon and it's not like a fun story or anything like that wait wait. why don't we at least say congratulations on your marriage congratulations on your honeymoon how was it for the most part it was great it was fun relaxing where'd you go i went to saint lucia very nice it was awesome weather was great it was like 85 and sunny every single day which is exactly where i want to be at all times because i like the sun but yeah it was it was great we had an awesome time we were there for what, like eight nights. On um, the last day, uh, it was really, really hot, and you can only stay in the sun for a certain amount of time. So we were debating between going to the pool and going into the ocean because you just needed to cool off some way. And the day that I was there, the ocean happened to be a little rough, but there were like flags to determine how the ocean was, and there was like a yellow flag, which means you can go in, but with caution. So I went in, it was totally fine. Like we were in the ocean, it was great. And then all of a sudden this like seven foot tall, like wave came to little me, that's like five, three. And I got completely like taken over. Like I was like drowning for a hot sec, but then thankfully it went away. And then while I was trying to like regain myself from this wave that like overtook me, I was like using my hands to like, oh my gosh, like trying to swim slash like get up. And I must have torn, like, I definitely, like, broke my humerus bone in the process of trying to, like, save myself slash, like, stay alive. That happened on the last day of our honeymoon. I did not get it checked out by doctors in my hotel because they charged $250 to have a doctor come. So I ended up having to wait two days um before we got back to the usa until we i could get a u.s doctor to check it out but yeah now i'm here back and kicking it and gonna be in this lovely sling here for about six weeks and then some physical therapy afterwards so definitely a honeymoon to remember my parents have been so paranoid about stuff like that happening and they're really paranoid about getting injured right before we go- went on the trip too but my uncle keith my, my uncle josh's partner keith we were in puerto rico and he broke his ankle and it was a very similar situation where it was just like we didn't know what doctors to go to and a whole mess of stuff and technically we're still in the u.s so it was a little bit easier and we spoke the language and all you know we spoke spanish to whatever puerto rican so but i just remember how hectic that can be and so, you know, my heart goes out to you, but, you know, hopefully, you know, you'll be better. It's not uh, anything serious. Did they say, are there any long-term effects? I hope not. <laughs> Me too. I just, you know. Hopefully with physical therapy, I'll be able to get like strength back in my shoulder. At the moment, I can't lift my arm all the way up, obviously, because I broke a bone that's like leading yeah. to your shoulder. So I think physical therapy will help with that. But I'm still young, so I sh- I'll be fine. Yeah. It's just more annoying than anything also in this industry that we work in. You know, it's I still got to use my hands somehow and just got to adapt to the situation. <laughs> Should I do? Fine. It reminds me of high school. Uh, this is a girl Brianna used to sit in front of me who had uh, an injury that was a long, I mean, I think it might have lasted more than a year or something, but she had to have somebody else like write notes for her 
uh, and she had to learn how to write with her weak hand. And then they used to use carbon paper or something like that, if I recall, so that she could copy other people's notes because she couldn't physically write pre-computers. Obviously, this was or pre-typing being the main way you would leave notes. So my heart goes out to you, but, you know, we'll get past it and hopefully everything, you know, will go back to normal. Uh, nothing dramatic has happened for me in that way. <laughs> Honestly, things are the, the, I mean, if I don't know what order this goes in, but I did break the server. Uh, that was a big <laughs> thing. And that is officially on the tail end of it being fixed and computers are starting to work kind of like normal again, caused a lot of, uh, stress, but we're, we're getting through that. I'm just trying to get through the summer, man. So how do you want to do this? You want to just, should I just jump into it? Since this episode is, you know, majority about how you got your start, I think why don't we start at the very beginning and tell us a little bit about childhood and a little bit about high school and if there were any inklings in that that structured where, you know, how you are as a person and where you, how you are today. So just to be clear, to give some people context, I own a production company. We primarily focus on branded content. Um, in post-production, uh, recently we've been talking about getting into production too. That might start happening in the next year. Not my favorite because then I have to deal with more clients. We'll see, but I do have some people here that uh, think that you know we'd be really good at it. Uh, but I guess what I'm going to be talking about is like just my journey of becoming a storyteller, a craftsperson, so to speak, and then really how I sort of honed in on the, on the craft of editing and then decided to start my company. You know, because it wasn't like I grew up with computers editing videos. It sort of came as a roundabout way of just being able to hone a craft, I guess, when we're talking about editing, when I eventually get there. So, yeah, I mean, I guess my family's always had some creative elements to it. I'm from a big Puerto Rican family. My grandfather was a folk singer. My father was an artist as well. I would say music was actually where it started. I grew up a drummer. I had a rock band. Um, there's this... Wait, so you had a rock band? Like, were you in a rock band or you had rock band ate the game? I did. My buddy owned rock band the game. That was the only way that I made friends in college. That's, that's 100% true because uh, I would play the drums there. But yeah, no, we had a, I had a rock band growing up in <laughs> high school. It was called Betrayed, B-R-T-E-Y-E-D or something like that. Funky spelling and everything. I mean, I, we grew up with Lincoln Park and Corn and Limp Biscuit and um, Slipknot, which their drummer just passed away a few days ago. Um, he's a legend. So like, we grew up with that kind of hard rock um, style, and I thought I was going to be a rock star. Um, I met Lincoln Park twice. My uncle's good friend, Stefano, come back later in the story too. But he was a roadie with Lincoln Park. This dude's got photos with them at Chuck E. Cheese. Like... That's how far back he went with these guys. Was a roadie with them. Obviously, they became one of the you know biggest bands in the world. He was along for the ride, so I've had the pleasure of being able to go backstage and meeting them twice, uh, especially Chester, who left an impression on me, and unfortunately, he passed away, but um, that hit pretty hard. Um, yeah, and I remember that my uncle, specifically, because he knew I was going to go talk to the drummer, spoke to him beforehand and said, yo, tell him, just make sure you tell him to stay in school. So that was the advice he gave me. And he was telling me what books he was reading on tour and stuff like that. I mean, but that was my exposure to like the arts. It was music first. Um, and then I went to Catholic school again for some context with Melissa's sister. That's how I know her. We both went to, and Melissa went to the same high school as me. Um, and really it was verbal storytelling that I think was the, th the, way that I started to move into this field. I was a huge anime nerd. I loved anime. Um, love. That's true. Sales do. And uh, I'll happily do, please, let the, if the people want it, I'll give them a full-on anime episode. I'm so down. That's why I'm like, come on, Dale, let us see your, this is all about you. We got to see your true side. Don't, don't lie here. You don't love it. I know, I'm in a white room it. here. I got to get my, I'll get my posters down here um, soon enough. But yeah, it's uh that is was my biggest uh, influence when it came to like visual mediums or anything like that because uh, Kellenberg, the school that we went to, is pretty academic. Is really reading and writing focused. I don't know how you felt. Like I didn't feel like there were any creative. There wasn't a big push for that many creative classes. Not that I 
I mean, it made me, it taught me how to study. It taught me how to write and read, I think, uh, better than a, a lot of other schools uh, might have. I think it's definitely changed, though, over the years. I oh, think yeah. when you were there, maybe there wasn't as much of a focus on arts, but I do think they are starting to, um, they're starting to implement new programs, so. Yeah, that's interesting, and I think that's, a, I mean, I think that's just a healthy thing because, they have a pretty big class four or 500. I mean, this is a diverse group of um, people. And basically it was, honestly, it was my brother's teacher, Mr. Frank, who <laughs> came up. So, so I was a verbal storyteller. Let me take this back for one second. I was a verbal storyteller. And like, I was like Gerald from Hey Arnold is the way I would say it. So when my buddy was like, I remember just like embellishing and telling the story of, Oh, you know, my boy, he was finally going to get the girl that he wants and he was in his car and it was raining and he, he had to turn around and all, you know, just sort of doing that kind of storytelling. Uh, and then I also started having these really intense dreams, like in my adolescence, weird stuff, prophecies and aliens and really weird stuff. And I would go into my homeroom in the morning and I would tell them to my boy, Brian, who sat next to me and I'd kind of then a bunch of people would start listening. And so that was really it. It was just like drawing a little bit of a, of a crowd of schoolmates, telling them either stories about each other, or these crazy dreams I was having. And then one day my brother's English teacher, Mr. Frank, was like, hey, you should think about writing. And that was really the only time that the only um, connection that I had to film at the time. There, I never made a movie. Um, I didn't even get into NYU by making a movie, which I guess is probably the part that people might be more curious about is like, how did you get to NYU, this, you know, prestigious uh, film school? But so it's a little it could be It could be because you made a science project. That was <laughs> your, probably your first video. That's true. That is, you know, that could have started it for you. And I could say that because my sister told me to talk about it since... She actually is the only one that still has a copy of it and plans to leak it when you, you know, if you somehow, you know, make millions I, and millions of dollars. <laughs> okay, it's actually funny that you bring that up because I was at their house the other day and I asked her for it because my boy Matt Starrett, who was in this video, Science Project, asked me on Instagram if somebody still has that video. And I was like, and she has it nice and safe. But basically, mm -hmm. wow, it's like I completely forgot about that. That's the only thing that I did do in high school. And we ended up getting 110 on it. So I guess if you want, you can call it a sign. And I know that they played it in science, in chemistry in particular, in chemistry classes ever since. And basically we did a spin on Conan O'Brien or something like that. And, and we made fun of all our teachers. And I got a bunch of my friends that weren't even at our school to help me out with it. And that's actually one thing that I will say. I didn't really remember this part about me. But my mom was cleaning out stuff the other day and found uh, that they wrote an article about me in the school newspaper that she must have kept that talked about how I was making this anime project. And I basically coerced and like solicited the Val of Victorian and some other people not and like known people in the school. And remember, I was a quiet kid and like a nobody um, to like help me with this project. So I would say maybe if looking back, the idea of like uh, getting a team together and, you know, sort of galvanizing people and being a leader <clears throat> maybe was something that I was doing, but I never thought about it or I'm still shocked that I end up where I am now, but it kind of looking back, maybe there were some, some aspects of that that I kept with me. Yeah, which is kind of weird. But there were some early signs there. I'm sure you were like leading that project. You had a vision. You were probably telling everyone what you should do and how it should be. And you were getting other people involved. And it's funny because like, that's kind of what you're doing. Yeah, uh, that's true. And, 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 and the, uh, the convincing these people to get in, to get, to help me with something that, you know, I was passionate about. That's the part where I was like, damn, dude you haven't really, the passion has changed and shifted, but like it's been, that's the thing that's been consistent. And I think in my twenties, it took, I kind of lost that, that energy. Uh, not that like the passion was there, but I didn't feel like I could express it. You know, that's what I think happened when I hit like adulthood. And then now I've kind of 
throwing it all away and I'm not afraid to say I'm trying to change the world. That's probably the biggest difference overall. But yeah, when it came down to choosing what college I was going to go to, what ended up happening in my in my high school career is uh, I got competitive with some ex-girlfriends that were girlfriends at the time. And then I, my grades went up. That was pretty much it. So I became an academic and I was focused on just crushing it from class to class. And then when this whole idea of becoming a writer came up, it was kind of, it, it just made me think. And so I, like I said, I loved anime and thought I was going to apply to some of these schools. It's going to be either that or psychology, film or psychology in some way. I thought it was going to be animation, honestly. So we started doing fine arts and I started, you know, going to Parsons in the summer and doing still life drawings. And uh, what ended up happening, this is going to be a bit roundabout, but it'll make sense. This Hurricane Katrina hit in 2005. Our school was sending down a bus filled with a couple a bunch of kids to go and hand out backpacks and help them out. Um, and the bus ride more than the actual trip. Now the trip was special, of course, and we were helping, but the bus ride, I was kind of a loner in high school, but I was really bored on this bus ride. And I started, I just started asking people questions and we started playing this question game and people were just starting to say, I don't really know what it was, but like stuff was just pouring out from all these people that I had sat with for four years and had no idea any of this stuff about them. Uh, and it was pretty remarkable. And so when I came back, I had already had Mr. Frank tell me to think about writing. I had this whole portfolio of art ready to go. And then about a week before I was going to apply to these schools, my father sat me down. He hates when I say this story, but it's true. And it's the best thing he ever did for me. He sat me down and said, listen, I don't think that this is your best foot forward. And he was talking about the artwork. You should think about writing something. And now this was the second time I had heard somebody say that to me. And I said, all right, I'll give it a shot. And I scrapped the entire portfolio I'd been working on for two years. And I ended up writing a short story about this bus ride down to New Orleans um, and the spin on it was, it was like a purgatory thing. It's probably super cheesy now, but it's like in a black and white world, you know, one guy can see all the colors in these people and they can only see one shade and, but he can see them all. It's probably like obsessed with the giver or something, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I kind of want to see it if you still have, it I have that. I have a script version of it because they made, that was one of the things that we had to do. And, uh, when I was a freshman, in, in, in college. So yeah, I just sort of took a gamble. I remember running around to everybody in, in, in that I was writing about to don't do this guys and be like, okay, so in my, in my story, you're a liar. Tell me about it. <laughs> and he's like, what you, what do you mean? I'm not a liar. I'm like, yeah, you are. Tell me, tell me, come on, get into it, bro. Oh God. So silly. Yeah. So I ended up submitting that short story and, and that was a big reason why I got into the school and so I kind of never looked back from them, but I fell in love with filmmaking in particular when I was a sophomore, when I was a freshman, I did take intro to animation. It's not what you so, think, you know, So wait, before we get into college, what made you decide? So what NYU is end game for you? Like, I'm sure you applied to other schools. Like you just realized, like once you got into NYU, you thought like, all right, maybe my dad is right. Like they're seeing the potential. So why don't I go for it? Yeah, I think so. The decision for NYU in particular, I think actually mostly stemmed from from Mr. Frank, this original teacher, because he had went there and then he went to Columbia for grad in creative writing. So I didn't really know much. But then when I Googled NYU, it just seemed really cool to be in the city. And I knew that it had a really big, well-known animation and film department. And mm -hmm. then I just thought, OK. That sounds really cool. And then my parents, I think, just got excited by the name of the school. They probably knew more than I did, honestly. And there was only two people in my entire class that went to NYU. So it wasn't like wow. one of the popular schools that people were applying to, you know? And I think more people could have definitely got into NYU. But like, you know, again, I think being coming from Catholic school, no disrespect to anybody and all their beliefs, but like probably... A bunch of those kids were probably just 
looking for more conservative, I guess, schools or something. I don't really know. But I think this was like a departure because there was only one of other of us in my class that was looking at it. But to me, I was just enamored. And when I visited, I was kind of hooked because their facilities are awesome. They're remarkable. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of it. I really don't, I, it's like, it, I was really just stumbling into it, sort of mm. trying to be, all that I knew was that if I was smart, it would open doors because my father was very big on education mm. and very big on being a leader. And those were the things that he hammered in. So I was just like, all right, dude, do good in school and you'll be able to figure out, you'll have more options. And then we sort of just took a spin on what some of my interests were. And then genuinely I fell in love when I got there. It was like later, like I was the kid at film school that they were like, Ooh, what do you think of citizen Kane? And I was like, I don't know. Is that movie in black and white? You know? And they were like giving me looks, never saw the Godfather. Um, pre-college I never saw I didn't even know who Stanley Kubrick was like it was like that you know like literally I was just if I think about it the the gigantic learning curve really came then so I felt I'll tell you exactly I could tell you exactly the moment where I was like oh this might be my shit they there's a film you have to take a film theory course called I think it's called the language of film when you're a freshman in NYU. And the first movie, I was with the chair of the department, Lamar Sanders, and the first movie that they showed was this film called Breaking the Waves by this director, Lars von Trier. And it's got, uh, I think it's got, her name's Emily Watson uh, in it, and um, Stellan Skarsgård. Actors you would recognize now, for sure. Anyways, this movie is about a tragic hero, Okay, I don't want to ruin too much, but it's, it's about a tragic hero. And the character's tragic flaw is that they love too much. Mm. Okay? This blew my mind to bits. I'm not going to lie. I the It's an extremely polarizing film. Mm -hmm. If anyone's seen it, please comment. Because I literally have not seen it since school and I'm waiting for the moment to watch it again. But it's that etched into my brain. Um. It completely split the class in half. And I think that's what Lamar was trying to do was to kind of say like, this is the medium. And these are the, look at the vast reactions you can have to this thing, but let's break it down from a narrative, you know, from a structure standpoint, from a narrative standpoint to just talk about what works and what might not work for you. But I was on the half that was like, this is brilliant because I didn't even like the idea of taking something traditionally good and then spinning it and twisting it freaking ah uh, really 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 well performed just like it's an awesome movie and then after that the second class they played american beauty and it was a wrap you know it was a wrap i was like okay now now we're talking i think i just got into it to try to impact people and make people think and make people you know have an experience or something because that's probably what i was what I enjoyed doing when I was verbal mm -hmm. storytelling. It's hard to pinpoint it, right? But when I, I'll tell you after those two movies, I was like, yep. Okay, how do I get good at that? And then sort of had a crash course there. And then I really, but I never actually picked up a camera until I was a sophomore. Interesting. Yeah. So you, I feel like it's interesting. Were you driven more toward how can I write a script like that or were what were you drawn to about it or just uh, maybe it was everything because it those movies in particular i feel like make you think and make you feel a certain way and you were like i want to what yeah i think that going back to the anime so my favorite work of art of like visual medium of all time is is uh neon genesis evangelion it's an anime and i think when i saw it i was a teenager and the kids were teenagers in the show and it's very mature themes um you know it's father ultimately it's about a father and son and um this father has made all these sacrifices to try to reunite with um his sort of long lost love and he sacrificed his relationship with his son in order to do it um and sort of ends up you know using his son and 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 it's about ultimately about his son's struggle with that relationship because he doesn't understand his father which obviously makes sense, right? He's 14, 
in, in the show. And so all the characters go through this uh, journey and, and it's, it had such like a profound effect on me. You know, I just sit there thinking about it and be and it, and it kept me with an open mind and it shared new perspectives with me. And the Japanese, a lot of the Japanese stories tend to, uh, I don't know if anti-hero is the right word. They like tend to, they're like filled with empathy. Like there's a weird Japanese trope in anime where like, there's a show called Demon Slayer, for example. What do you think that show's about? I don't know, but we're going down a whole anime round. We've got I to, but like it. it'll make, you know. <laughs> that's, all right, so Demon Slayer is about a guy who kills, who slays demons. So, Shocker. Yeah. Uh, here's one of the twists. His sister's a demon. So you, oh, you, so, you yeah. so you have to start to question, think about like, oh, but she's good. So, like, how do we feel about demons now? Then, every time this guy kills a demon, this is such a Japanese thing, they, like, have this whole scene. Like, he's about to kill the demon, right? And then they're like, the demon starts talking. The demon's like, you know something, man? I understand that you got to do this. And then it's like a flashback to, like, the demon's childhood and and how he was, like, beaten by his dad. And then you're like, oh, man, this demon's a real person too, you know? Yeah. (laughs) And so, like watching stuff like that young uh without knowing it was like building this skill of like empathy that i think is just so valuable that i i use in my everyday life that is a core value at my company now and having these perspectives not only was i entertained i felt like i was learning something and it was having just this like profound impact on me personally and so i think that's like what i got addicted to was like damn i want to give people the same feelings that i got when i saw these things And that's kind of what hooked me. So when I saw Breaking the Waves, when I saw American Beauty, and obviously there's so many others that have affected me now, um, I was just like, oh, wow. Like you can get such a diversity of experience, of feeling. And I was like, yeah, if I can get good at that and make people feel these things, I would be such a happy and and like fulfilled person. And it started as simple as that. Mm. Like honestly. Um, And then, of course, you know, all the work is derivative in the beginning and I sucked and I was super probably just like trying so hard to be profound and took me a long, long, long time to really figure out and find my voice. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think that turning, I'm fortunate though that I think I turned way more towards craft during my four years at college. Um, We're just getting good at the mechanics of telling the story Mm -hmm. became a big, such a big priority because I like to be good at things also. And I feel like that's been a big help that now, now when I'm coming back to creating again, I feel like I have so much more control and maturity and like agency in the choices that I'm making. And I mean, well, we'll see, we'll see if any of that's effective. Right. But that's really how it started. That's interesting. It's funny how you can see patterns Yeah, and it's, you know, even just, empathy and how you even use that as one of your core values at your, at your job. And that's, that's incredible. Yeah. And it goes back to what I was saying when I was like, and then I look at some things in my past, my mom pulls up this article and Mm -hmm. I'm like, wow. So these are traits or qualities that were there. And this is kind of why I'm big on the whole, like take time to think, be thoughtful, look at yourself and figure it out Mm -hmm. because, um, I think the sooner that, obviously the sooner you get anywhere, the better, right? The sooner that you find it, the better. Not not that there's anything wrong with not knowing what you want right now, because I certainly didn't when I was in college, but, you know, once it clicked, uh, things got a lot easier, you know? And I just don't think people, I don't think people think are encouraged to think about it too much. Um, you know, I think they're encouraged to, you know, if you're not a doctor or a lawyer, you're X, Y, Z. I was actually on a date with somebody who said that their father said you're too stupid for X, Y, Z thing. Wow. Yep. And I'm like, wow. We're stupid, Dale. <laughs> right? I'm just thinking about it. Imagine that. Like, you you know, that's, that's what you think. And so then you end up doing what you're told because we're humans and we're young and that's, that's like what's going to mm-hmm. happen. And then all of a sudden you wake up and you're 40 and you hate, your, you hate everything you do. And th- this is what we spend most of our time doing. And you didn't follow necessarily your parents' footsteps in what you were pursuing or your brother or you said, you know, maybe a folk singer was. 
I got to say that I think you bring up like a super excellent point because I'm like a first generation, basically one and a half. You know, my father was born in Puerto Rico. Neither of them went to college or they didn't finish college. And so they, I think that their journey of getting out of the hood, which I think they don't give themselves, you know, like they see success as like American millionaire success. And I'm like, you don't even know you guys, which you did in your lifetime is the most remarkable thing I can ever like imagine. So, but I think for them, they were just like super excited to just this prospect. No, t t my father's a salesman, a marketing specialist salesman. My mother was a secretary. Music might be the only connection. My father was a illustrator, fashion designer for a short period of time too. That was something that might've played into it. Um, but I think if I followed in his footsteps, I would have pursued baseball <laughs> as a career. I and, can't even imagine. That. Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's so weird now. But the blessing is that they, I mean, it was a twofold thing. I'm the kind of person that could never really be told. Like if you told me to do something, it was just hard to, t you had to negotiate with me. You couldn't tell me to do something. There's no way you were going to get me to do what you wanted me to do. I always had that part personality that was like nope it has to be on my terms fail or not but they were just amazing and they were like completely comfortable to push it some things that they did not account for or they might have and i'll say this for anybody too who's young and thinking about college right now is like dude nyu man those loans buried me and i think they were so excited at the prospect of having this status symbol that they didn't even question the fact that i was about to get crushed for like the first 10 years of my life outside of school i signed everything away i'll ne and you know what's you know what i'll just say this too from my mom who hopefully is listening this woman opened up my early decision letter before i even got there i came <laughs> home and she's like something came for you in the mail and i was like and it was oh. already open yes i was like what you did such a shitty job of re-putting this together and i like snatched it and i ran <laughs> upstairs to open it up she had a sh eating grin on her face the whole time. <laughs> Aww. And then I remember I opened it up and it was obviously an acceptance letter and I run to the top of the stairs and my mom's dancing at the bottom of the stairs. We're going to the Oscars. We're going to the Oscars. Yeah, that's what she said. So like there's, it, it's an awesome thing when you have parents that are just like, we'll do what it takes when, when we, that are going to enable that kind of passion, you know, but at the same time, there's a sense, you know, I w sometimes I wonder if there was a little bit more, I don't even know, man, I guess, you know, it's just money at the end of the day, but like, I, there's going to be a whole debate. Maybe we'll do a whole other video about it, about the value of it, of, of college in general. And, and oh, like, yeah. yeah, cause for me, for me, it was essential, but I don't think it's needed for everybody. Especially in maybe our fields. I feel, I don't know. You learn a lot in college about yourself and where you want to eventually end up like your end game job but i feel like you also learned a lot about how to do your job once you're actually doing it yeah there's yeah. no and and so i would this is one of the things about nyu that is uh very strong when i tell people about what i was doing and they were telling me about what they were doing in college i was like oh this is a different type of program for example when you're taking a production class it's it's like uh, nine to six, three days a week or two days a week. It's like full on and you're making stuff. Sight and Sound Film, their flagship program, you make 20 films in a semester. I also took Sight and Sound Studio. I was in a studio with three cameras and a crew of 12 rotating every day, trying everything. And you'd make three, two or three projects there. So it was very much go learn the theory in the first half of the day and then apply it and do it. And I luckily had the mentality because they, I listened to them. Cause again, I, I didn't think I was anything special. Most of the kids coming in are like industry babies. They like know they've wanted to do this. So they're in there trying to make their smash Sundance hit like day one. I was like, I don't know. Shit. What are you telling me to do? And they said, treat everything like an exercise. That's what you do. Taste, try and experiment. And so I was like, great. I'm going to try to do this one in one shot. I'm going to try to do this one in split screen. I'm going to try to do this one focusing on shot reaction shot and just kept things sort of basic. But I was in the try hard group. 
Like we were tryhards. Like they were like, oh, you can't do this. I was like, sucka. And I took everybody out to Long Island and we shot on a beach. And I was like, ah, no one can do that because you're all over, you know, don't have access to Long Island stuff, beaches and stuff. You know, like we were tryhards like that, but it was always with the idea of experimentation and growth in in mind because I, I was a newbie. And, and, you know, funny thing, this whole thing started with writing. I freaking hate writing. I'm horrible at it also. And I learned that in school too. Story, my story sense was strong. My actual writing, like making people feel real in terms of like dialogue, like so beat structure, that kind of thing is my strength. Dialogue, no, 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 no. I don't talk like normal people. I don't think like normal people. And everything I wrote is, you, I like broke the cardinal rule and they would have to tell me time. They're like, Dale, people don't talk like this. They don't say what they feel, okay? And I was like, I just... But why not? Like, and they're like, you know, <laughs> I just couldn't get that concept through my head. Now, obviously, it's much clearer and makes much more sense. But that was like my biggest struggle in college. So given that that was something that you learned, I feel like you've been on a bit, just telling this story, it's been a bit of like a roller coaster. It's like, okay, you're a storyteller. You liked writing. You got into NYU with writing. Then you got into these classes. And then when was it when you started to realize that like the editing portion mm. of it was kind of where you wanted to potentially even put your focus on or where did, when, how did you pinpoint where you found it the most interesting? Um, that's a great question. And this is a super useful tip for anybody that's in school, that's uh, coming out and is trying to figure out what they're going to do. And I have, a, you know, I have interns here. They're all asked me the same question. Um, here was my strategy. And I actually think it's pretty good. One of the biggest decisions that you're going to have to make, and I don't know what it's like akin to in, in, on, on sort of your side, but one of the biggest things for us is do you want to be on or off set? Okay. That is a decision that, cause the industry does kind of split like post-production and production and pre-production that it kind of does split because mm -hmm. the connections that you make and develop are going to lead you into different paths. And when I was coming out, I wasn't sure where I was going to head practically. I felt like I was learning things and then I was tasting so many things. I started to become known for certain things. Editing became one of those things that I started getting known for. Okay, I had already won one or two sort of common editing awards when I was in school because I was just working on some people's thesis films and um, it started going well. And it's funny because when editing it, I'm a pretty like, I my style is very different than most. If you ask most people, how do they know when they made the right cut? They're gonna say, I felt it. It's a gut thing. Um, for me, there's no, that doesn't, that I do the opposite. For me, it's accounting, it's a math thing. I know when I made the right cut, when I can see the proportions on the timeline and they're correct for whatever effect I'm trying to get. When I started editing, it was more like same idea with the filmmaking. Let me experiment. I'll give you an example. I worked on this awesome short called The Animal Drill and there were these action sequences. And I said, let me try to play with pacing and I'm gonna just count it out. And so each time there was an action sequence, it was a different rhythm going back to being a drummer. And so I'd say, okay, we're gonna go three, three, this is in, in, in time, three seconds, three seconds, one, 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 half, 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 12 seconds. And I wanted to see what effect that would have. And I just would cut it kind of blindly like that. And then if I like that effect, which that kind of a ramping effect, that 12 second shot would feel really long. And uh, I guess it worked because that's when I won my first editing award. And I was like, maybe you're on to something, right? And maybe you should stick with this thing um, because you might have a knack for it. So that was my offset job. Onset, when I was doing that site, that studio class and just in general, the management, going back now to, to some of the stuff in high school, the management aspect, I started to excel at and there's a role on set called the assistant director who basically is the the boss of the set they're the ones that are like telling people making sure everybody's doing what they're supposed to be doing keeping track of the schedule and like making sure everything is happening the right way um, and freeing up this director space 
to do what they got to do creatively, right? And when I was in that studio class, I was AD for this, uh, this Korean kid. And I'll never forget at the end of that, he sent me an email saying, I would never have gotten through this class without you. Thank you so much for, you know, helping me make my projects. So, you know, it started with, I did like it, but like, hey, you're pretty good at these two things. You know, did not like doing sound, kind of liked camera, but I really like just telling the camera where to go, not necessarily dealing with the lighting. And I mean, I cared about things being good and being done right, but it was, didn't really gravitate there. Definitely not an art director type of person. My design sense is horrible. I'm that, I'm like super logical. So thinking abstractly was very difficult and thinking, um, emotionally when it comes to design was very difficult too. Like this color makes you feel that way. I'd be like, that's weird. Why? It's just a color. Okay. I get it now. Like I'm just and much more appreciative, but even now those are the, I lean on my art director heavily. If I'm doing a project, I'll be like, you tell me what color works. This is the emotion I'm trying to get at, you know? And they're like that color with that outfit and these earrings. I'm like, you go girl, get them or guy, you know, like dress them, <laughs> makeup, like I rely heavily on their expertise because it's like, it's my weakness. But with my cinematographer, I'm like, here we go. This lens, that angle. And usually we're on the same page, but that might be a, uh, somewhat of an unorthodox thing too. Where like, I call my lens lengths and where the camera goes on my sets. And I work with cinematographers who appreciate that. You know, mm-hmm. they love that I'm in tune with them and I understand a bit about their craft. That's but I only work with a certain kind of cinematographer who appreciates that, not the kind who really wants to set where the camera goes, uh, for example. So these are things that you found by working, to your point. Yeah. And then when I was coming out, I said, great, I have one onset job and one offset job. And again, guys, we're talking about, we're not talking about being a writer director, okay? And I know a lot of these schools push you to do that. We're talking about practical skills that will earn you money as soon as you come out. It's on you to make your own just got to say that. So we're not talking about me and my ambitions to tell stories or own a company because I, this was me saying, what are the most practical skills that I could use to market myself to get into a place that, and here would be the benefit, kept me close to where I wanted to end up. Editors get to hang out with the producers and the directors and are, the close, are very close to story. And I knew that I wanted to be close to story. The assistant director also hangs out with the producer and the directors and it's close to management. And I knew that at the end of the day, I wanted to be managing story, AKA directing or in that above the line position. So it was strategic in that sense. However, if you want to be, if you enjoy sound design or if you enjoy color correction, you have to think about it in two ways. I, I don't know how you felt about this when you were in college, Melissa. Cause like for me, I was like, I always know where I want to end up. And then I just, and I need something that's going to help me get there. Did mm-hmm. you like, did you have like your, I'm going to be, I'm going to have my own agency one day, or I don't even know what your big dream is. If, or if you're happy, I know, you, I know you say you have your dream job. So, you know, that could be I, that, but. I don't know. I feel like it's, it's funny. We have a different perspectives, obviously. I am still figuring out where I want to end up. Mm. I could say that the, I'm in my dream job, but I'm just really happy where I'm at right now. Mm. Um, I think that when I was in school, like you said, I just wanted to get a job in the field and I was trying to do what I, you know, what would be the best way for me to get there strategically. Like you said, for me, it was getting a lot of internships because I knew that would help strengthen my resume. So I like pushed myself really hard to get that. And then you know, pushing my, getting myself out there, reaching out to whoever it is to share my resume. And if they were interested in me after a few interviews, then I, you know, that would be where it is. It is a little different than you, but I think we both had that strategy with what we wanted to do and what would be the best way to get us there. Mm. Even though it was a little different in the sense that, you know, you, you knew how to get there, but you were still like kind of figuring it out. Well, you know, what's funny, actually, it's like I had no idea how to get there, but there is this pressure that I think we probably both had because, you know, just going to college was a big deal or whatever. I just knew that if I, I just knew I had to do something. And I do think there's another decision that you guys make on or offset also like working in or out of the industry. If you're like a writer, for example, you could be like my homegirl Zoe, who literally like came out and became like a translator for financial institution and then came home and wrote every night. 
but she's an artist. Film is her medium. I fell in love with making stuff. So I became a craftsman and had to work in the industry making stuff in order to feel fulfilled. Mm. Okay. Yeah. And then just to, to sort of push a little bit forward here, I did both of those things, felt that the AD work wasn't as fulfilling, probably just from a logistics standpoint, like it's long days, it's very stressful. And I, I remember when I decided to stop doing it is I read an article that ADs, because I was thinking about potentially going union with it. Mm. ADs had the lowest life expectancy in the film industry. Oh, wow. And a lot of them become smokers or get addicted to coke also. Straight up, I was, just, I was this article and I was like, you know what? I think I'll take my like air conditioned, you know, room. And I'm also an introvert. So it was like not that hard for me to be like, oh, so I just get to sit behind a computer and in a cold room for eight hours. And I was like, I'll take it. If we get some hate mail from some ADs that are perfectly living their life, not addicted to coke, <laughs> I will direct them in your way, Dale. Um, I will send them your email address and you can have it with I never said that. I just there are probably some great it. guys. Out there. <laughs> no judgment. <laughs> you can't believe everything that no you judgment made, my do friend, you. But do I you. do. I do think that you made the right decision based on your personality and based on you, your likes and your dislikes and i feel like if you would have went down that ad route you might not have you know been you fulfilled know. and you probably would have ended up maybe where you are right now because you were toying between the two so well i was just gonna agree with you like i think <laughs> yeah. at the end of the day it's funny because i've combined both of those things ultimately so i i think like it would have been a different path um but it's funny because maybe i would have you just said it like maybe i would have ended up here in a sense. Um, but again, just for the practicality of things, when you're entering that third or fourth year, um, to be, that's when you would want to start thinking about it. What are the marketable skills and crafts that I can look towards that ultimately keep me heading towards this goal? And for me, it was always going to be direction of some sort. Now it's shifted, of course, and I am, but I am, and I can say a hundred percent, I get the same feeling running this company every day that I do when I'm on a film set, managing a crew and, um, you know, putting, putting creative action into to practice. So, but there's no, I didn't even know that. And it's not like they said, go start a company in freaking art school. You know, that wasn't ever even part of the conversation. My father would say it, but well, I'm, I think I'm going to listen to my father, you know? So <laughs> that's sort of what, what I found interesting. So again, I think if you're, if you're looking at it on or off set, and I think, if you're on the account side, still should know do where where roughly you'd want to end up. I think probably for you, a bigger thing was that you probably knew you wanted to end up at a bigger firm, not a smaller one. Yeah, I guess so. And because bigger, I mean, this isn't probably the same anymore. Right. It's when you, starting when to you were, flip flop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But I can see yeah. when you were starting, you were like, I want to learn from the best and be a part of this yeah. big thing. Yeah, because once you're at like a bigger firm, you get exposure to bigger clients and more well-known clients and you start to gravitate toward what are those brands that you want to work on or you want to, you know, you're interested in. Um, so yeah, bigger firms do have that, but obviously now like smaller firms are starting to, you know. Well, that would be the next sort of just big thing to talk about in my career is like, remember guys, when I went to school, no Facebook, no Instagram, no YouTube, or like these things came out when I was in school, the digital revolution, the 5D Mark II, which changed cinema cameras forever. Like you probably shoot a lot of content on a cell phone right now, Melissa, I'm assuming. Oh yeah. We shot a whole, one of our most popular campaigns was shot on a cell phone. Right. And that is something that was not impossible when I was in school. And so it took a while to get through that journey. Um, when I came out, I went into independent film. I'm sure... Um, I mean, there are plenty of sort of war stories uh, coming in into the industry um, that I think I'll share probably some of those in another video, but uh, maybe I'll just do some of the big hallmarks that led me here, which is literally when I first got out of school. So here's my, my, my system. I feel like we've talked about this in other videos, but to me, I was like, get good, figure out if you're going to be good enough to be where you want, where your ambitions are. And you don't have to be that good now. I just had to know that I would be. And so I needed to start getting some sort of a verification 
in some way. Well, I happened to get this crazy opportunity literally like a week after I graduated through my man Stefano, who was, you know, this this friend of the family, um, roadie of Lincoln Park, but he was working with Billy Joel's daughter. And um, about a week out of graduating that summer, this guy calls me up. I'm at Tish and says, listen, brother, come to Electric. Do you know where Electric, have you ever heard of Electric Lady Studios? I was like, no. Turns out it's one of the most famous recording studios like ever on McDougal Street. Well, he tells me, go on McDougal. He's like, oh, you're, you're, at, you're on Broadway? Come here now. And uh, again, I'll probably save the full story for another day, but I had to come meet Billy Joel's team, pitch a music video on the spot, narrowly get this job opportunity, and then do a, a music video for Billy Joel's daughter. That was pretty much, that was the most, that was the real test, you know, of like, whoa. And then having to keep it together. And I remember one of my dear friends telling me, you should co-direct this with somebody. It's too big for you right now. Same. And then, you know, my dumbass self was like, no, if I'm going to fit, I need to know. I need to know if I could do this. Um, I made it through that, uh, which had out all the things. And I was, I'll, you know, that had all the things that you think would be a challenge on a, on a film set in that regard. Pushed through, got some lovely compliments from Tommy Burns, which is a, Billy Joel's like music producer. And I think he plays guitar with him on stage. And then realized, okay, like you can do it. Hey guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode of the CNA podcast. If this brought you any value, please don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that notification bell. You know how much it means.